coming up, Filet lands on a comet. Landing a space plane at an airport. And Orion rolls out. Plus, we're going to be talking about the role of science in movies. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Welcome to Tomorrow, episode 7.35 for Saturday, November 15th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me again is the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham. We'll be your hosts for this episode, and we have got some amazingly awesome space news this week. Before we get into that, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. New this week is Lisa at the end of that particular list. So Lisa, thank you for becoming a premier member of Tomorrow. You can get more information over at patreon.com slash tmr. Oh, all right, I'm speaking fast because there is so much awesome news that came from very, very far away. You've probably seen in the news the Filet Lander, part of the Rosetta spacecraft, that whole big thing. And what I'd like to do is tell the story of this whole thing all the way back to the beginning. Uh, starting with, uh, you know, first off, we, they were going to launch, I think, in 2013, and that all got delayed until March 2nd, 2014, um, not 2013, that's the wrong decade. The other uh, 2003, 20-03, they actually launched March 2nd, 20-04, and here's that launch coverage. One, two, un, top. Allumage Vulcan. Décollage. And there you go, an Ariane 5 carrying Rosetta in filet off to space for an over 10-year journey to get to Comet 67P. But you can't just launch a rocket into space and expect it to get to its destination that far away. You actually have to do several gravity assists. And so we ended up first doing our first gravity assist on March 4th, 2005. So you can see there was the launch. We come by through, we do our first gravity assist with Earth on March 4th. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna hang out we're going to, a couple years later, we're going to continue going around until February 25th, 2007, where we do our Martian gravity assist. And then we keep going. We still don't have enough speed. And every time we do one of these gravity assists, we're going faster and faster and faster until our uh, second gravity assist, which is November 13th, 2007. And then we're going to keep going. And about a year later on November 13th, uh, not a year later, two years later, on 2009, we do another gravity assist with Earth, all trying to get speed up so that we can actually get to this comet. Now, we have to go a really long time to the comet. There's not a whole lot of power on the vehicle. So coming up, what we're going to do is we're going to enter a deep sleep on June 8th, 2011. And then we're going to sit there for two years and seven months and 12 days in this hibernation mode. We have no idea if this craft is even going to wake up. But then we exit deep sleep on January 20th, 2014, and it actually worked. And there was a huge cheering control room, and it was awesome. And then finally, on August 6, 2014, we actually reach a Comet 67P. 10 years of a journey, <laughs> slinging around the Earth three times to mm -hmm. pick up speed, slinging them around Mars to pick up speed, going to sleep, biting, is this thing going to wake up? This is what we're dealing with. Eventually, we actually make it. Now, this is the Rosetta spacecraft with Philae Lander sitting out there. Mm -hmm. Now, the Rosetta spacecraft has been actually at the comet doing its thing, but it wasn't until very recently that Philae detached, actually detached Wednesday, November 12th at 0900 coordinated uh, universal time. And when it detached Rosetta, the spacecraft, the shepherding spacecraft, took a peek down and grabbed this shot. This is a shot of Philae going towards the Comet 67P after it hit detached. You can see the three landing legs there. So cute. It's 300 million miles away from Earth. It takes 22 minutes for signals traveling at the speed of light to go from Rosetta 
to Earth. That's how far away this is. Now, we're going down towards the comet. It's going to take about seven hours for this craft to very slowly slide down and reach the comet. And then it's supposed to do two things. One, it's supposed to fire thrusters on the top of the vehicle that will allow it to kind of be pressed against the surface. And two, it's going to fire harpoons into the surface of the, of the comet. And this is what it looked like when it landed. You can actually see the shot. You actually see a little bit of one of the legs. Mm -hmm. And this is Comet 67P up close and personal from Philae. Now, the problem is the thrusters on top designed to press it against the comet did not pressurize. So it, that didn't happen at all. The harpoons that were supposed to then connect fillet into the comet didn't fire. So all of the mechanisms in place to keep the little lander that could on the comet did not work. And as a result, it bounced. In fact, it bounced over a kilometer from when it first landed. It went up and it kind of bounced. It actually bounced a couple of times uh, and it came to rest two hours after the initial contact with the comet. Uh, the problem with it not landing where it was supposed to is it kind of landed in a bit of a crater and it's been, it's solar, it's photovoltaics, it's solar panels have been shielded from the sun and it was designed to have sunlight to keep the vehicle powered. So it was a race. The scientists then need to go, okay, we've got 50 hours or so of battery power on right. this thing. Let's do science. And they did. They they did everything they could with as many scientific instruments as they could, took that data and uploaded it up to the vehicle. And actually, uh, data, I think there's one more in there called energy. Uh, it may not be in the rundown, but uh, or battery or something like that. And what happened was uh, after they had uploaded all of the um, uh, all of the data from Philae up to Rosetta and then kind of used that to bounce it back to Earth, the battery signals dropped radically. And uh, it kind of does this sort of like do 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 boosh. Yeah. And you're like, oh, sad. Yep. So that was that was that, unfortunately. And uh, the vehicle is basically it, it dumped off, and then the vehicle kind of went into a safe mode. It was basically sending uh, status updates only, going, "Hey, I don't have power. I don't have power." And uh, we have since lost contact with Flay. Now you might think, oh. It's out of power. That was cool. We got a lot of great science off of it. This was an amazing thing. First time humanity has ever landed on a comet. How awesome is that? But not all hope is lost. We can actually uh, potentially maybe get access to Filet one more time as Comet 67P gets closer to the sun and as it kind of spins around a little bit, there might be enough sunlight that hit the solar panels uh, there, there's got to be a lot of things that kind of line up here. Yeah. But it is possible that in about a year, there's a very slight chance that Filet could come back to life and they could continue to do additional things. So over a decade, well over a decade in the works, heck, even just a decade getting from Earth to Comet 67P, this has been an amazing story. And people have loved this. And it's got great Twitter accounts, Filet 2014. Uh, and then some of the science instruments themselves also have Twitter accounts, which you can find on uh, all, on ESA's website as well, the European Space Agency. That all happened basically, like not all of it, obviously that was a decade long thing, but all of the news from Filet happened within this last week. Mm -hmm. And it was fun to watch the live streams. It was fun to get the pictures back. It's an amazing craft and an amazing accomplishment from the European Space Agency. A huge kudos to everyone on those teams who helped make that happen. This This was truly truly remarkable so there you go that is our update from filet if you can't tell we're excited this was just cool stuff this was really cool stuff uh speaking of really cool things sierra nevada yeah sierra nevada corporation actually uh the recent space traffic management conference made an announcement or a presentation about the possibilities of having their dream catcher vehicle land at regular public airports dream chaser what did I say? Dreamcatcher. Yeah. I mean, that is a thing. It's just not the correct... <laughs> it's, not, it's not the spaceship. <laughs> Sorry. Dream chaser. Uh, all right, internet, I need you to build me a Dreamcatcher spaceship. Oh, goodness. Photoshop. I, I am so sorry. Uh, yes. So, the Sierra Nevada Corporation, again, like I said, was at the Space Traffic Management Conference, the first of its kind, is my understanding, um, giving the presentation on the pluses and minuses of landing at public airports, uh, what kind of infrastructure might be needed, if there's any sort of um, 
uh, changes to the, the landing, I almost said landing pad, but to the runways and whatnot, if, if anything like that would be needed, you know, as opposed to a spaceport, I guess is, is sure. the big point here. Uh, Dream Chaser, as you know, Dream Chaser, uh, is it can be crewed or uncrewed. It's a low Earth orbit, uh, doing low Earth orbit missions, and it's basically a space plane with the way that it lands and takes off. It has all non-toxic propellants, which is very cool, and no unique landing or navigation aids and responsive to mission, ground, and transportation operations. Well, the non-toxic is a big deal because most spa- most crafts that go into space have hypergolic fuels, which mm-hmm. are toxic, mm-hmm. and you wouldn't want to land that at a traditional airport. You'd exactly. want to land it at a spaceport of sorts exactly. be- that have the facilities to deal with these toxic fuels. Mm-hmm. A non-toxic craft, it, it changes the equation. You can do quite a bit more with it. So yeah. that's, that's really cool news, or potential news from Sierra Nevada, right? They, exactly. They're not saying they're going to do it. They're saying no. that, hey, we're looking at potentially just landing this at airports. Just mm-hmm. why do we need a spaceport for this? Very cool. Which, yeah, neat. Uh, speaking of other really great things that are happening, Orion, the next generation human spacecraft that's going to bring us beyond low Earth orbit, has rolled from its assembly building to the pad. So it moved, I'm, well, it's not really, well, yeah. So it moved from launch abort servicing facility to Space Launch Complex 37 this last week. Uh, December 4th is the launch date for this vehicle. It's going to be launching on top of a Delta IV Heavy for Exploration Flight Test 1. This is not a crewed mission. This is simply a test mission only. It's only going to last a few hours, actually. They're going to launch it on that Delta IV Heavy, basically empty, no humans aboard. Mm -hmm. They're going to test out the systems. They're going to make sure that the heat shield works. They're going to make sure the avionics works. They're going to make sure that the craft performs as they expect before they put humans on board. Uh, Once that's done, uh, this is kind of the precursor to EM-1, which is Exploration Mission Number 1, and that's set to launch de- uh, December, September 20th, 2018, aboard the new space, the shiny new, it'll have that new rocket smell, mm. Space Launch System, and that will actually have humans. And when you're looking at that picture, it, that's kind of a uh, uh, fast motion time lapse of the rollout to Slick 37. Uh, when you're looking at that, the capsule's actually inside of all of that. That huge shroud on top is all of the launch abort system. And if I remember right, it's it's ext- the launch abort on Orion is really heavy. It's like 16,000 pounds or something like that for this abort system. So here you can see it's at uh, Slick 37. And then what they're going to do is they're going to take it, they're going to lift it up on top of that Delta IV Heavy, attach it, mate it to the uh, rocket, and um, then they're going to launch it into space on December 4th. And it's going to be... It's going to be exciting. It's going to be cool. This is, again, the United States getting ready to send humans back into space and humanity getting ready to go beyond low Earth orbit. We could go back to the moon. We could go to Mars. We can go to asteroids. We can send humans to asteroids in a vehicle like this. So this is that enabling mission that allows us to do really cool things. All right, moving right along. Planetary Ventures LLC has plans to uh, rehabilitate Moffett Field. Which is this right here. Ta-da. Remember the old airships from like World War II? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually to rehabilitate, I apologize, I misspoke again, to rehabilitate Moffett Federal Air, Airfield, with, which includes Hangar 1, Hangar 2, and Hangar 3. And this is one of those hangars that you're looking at right there. Yes, exactly. Uh, this is a 60-year lease with the Google Shell firm Planetary Ventures LLC that plans to rehabilitate all, all of this, saving approximately $6.3 million in annual maintenance from NASA's part. So it's they're actually leasing it from NASA. NASA will maintain, uh, I guess, the lease, really. And um, some of my notes are missing. But from what I remember, they are not just going to be doing Hangar 1, but that will go towards uh, research, development, building, testing, uh, emerging technologies such as aviation, rover robotics, and space exploration. Uh, but the rest of uh, Moffett Federal Airfield is about 1,000 acres and includes Hangar 1, 2, and 3. It actually also has two runways, an airfield flight operations building, and a private golf course. Actually, the chat room brings up a valid point. They're like, is that a recent? photo because I thought they removed all the cladding they did uh, it actually looks like a, a kind of a bare bone structure right now uh, but I believe Google's going to be bringing it back to look something closer to that yes that was kind of the problem uh, NASA took everything off said oh this is really toxic this is really dangerous this is there's a lot of work that has to go into it and then this 
Google firm kind of came in and said, "Ah, oh, we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it." Uh, they're also uh, <coughs> pretty much. Uh, they're also going to be building an educational center so you can learn the history of Moffett Air, Federal Airfield as well as uh, any sort of emerging technologies that are coming out. All right, and before we go into break, I did want to give a quick update on the NTSB, the National Transportation mm -hmm. Safety Board's investigation of Spaceship Two. Uh, I, I, I've kind of wanted to say continuing coverage, breaking news, all of those words. Uh, but the NTSB on Friday, November seventh, twenty four. Did interview Peter Siebold, who was the pilot of Spaceship Two. He's the one who did survive the crash. Uh, he was, according to those records, he was basically extracted. He was pulled from the rocket. He then unbuckled his seat to let that go, and his uh, uh, parachute automatically deployed, allowing him to land safely. He did not know that his co pilot, Mike Alsbury, had unlocked the feathering mechanism. Uh, now, for those who aren't aware, uh, this B-roll, so I, I probably should have removed the, flat, the flashes to black. I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, but uh, uh, So this is the NTSB crew going out there and investigating all of the wreckage. They've actually uh, moved the wreckage. They've, they're taking care of all of that. They're expected to continue to do this investigation for the next year or so. And so at this point, updates are going to be much more sporadic in between all of these different times. Um, uh, it's stored in a secure location. They're gonna that way. If they need to do any follow up, they totally can. Um, and then at this point, the NTSB has left Mojave. They've gone back to Washington D.C. They're going to continue to evaluate the telemetry and all of the different data that they have. And because this was a test vehicle, they had tons and tons of telemetry and data to sift through. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, our main topic with the movie Interstellar that just came out and the science geek. Now we have not seen Interstellar. We're going to this afternoon. What the science geeks are looking at this movie and going, "What the what?" We say we're going to ask the question, should Hollywood movies that kind of have that science background that aren't considered sci-fi, mm -hmm. should they maybe honor science a little bit better than they're doing right now? So stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to tomorrow. Uh, before we get into our main topic of uh, Hollywood movies and science fiction, science fact, and all of those things, I did want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode work. These are the people who've contributed at least $5 to this episode. You can get more information on how you can become a crowdsource member over at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. We are a crowdfunded show, so every single dollar helps. All right, getting into this, um, so... I want to be very clear really quickly. Uh, we have not seen the movie, so we can't give you spoilers. But, it, yeah. So you don't have to worry about that part, at least not on, about Interstellar. But, but it's not just Interstellar, right? So no, you exactly. actually have a note, you have notes mm -hmm. of different movies, right? You've mm -hmm. got 2001 A Space Odyssey, mm -hmm. which actually feels like, uh, of all everything in this list, mm -hmm. is the one that holds true to science the best, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they really think about artificial gravity and... Well, Kubrick is very well known for being obsessive about details. He actually contacted, I think it said something like 50 different or people, 50 different people that were representing uh, almost all the space agencies that existed at the time. This is like 1968 or so. you got to say the early 60s or so, mid early 60s, um, you know, for those details to make sure that if it, even if it wasn't something that existed in 1968, that it's theoretically possible to have existed, uh, such as like the gravity, you know, you've got the seat, the famous scene where the person sort of walking all the way sure, around. Sure, yeah, yeah. You know, those sorts of Which things. Which is funny because um, uh, we see that same kind of scene in Skylab. Yeah. Right? I mean, they kind of, you see them walking around. And Precisely. It, it looks very, very similar Precisely. to what happened in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yes. Yeah, so, and then you've got other movies in here. Space Cowboys 2000, which, oh man, now I feel old because I feel like that movie came out not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so there's, there's, that. there's that Moon 2009, which for those who have not seen Moon, I feel like is a really great movie and should is really, uh, really uh, you see. Sh totally should see Gravity 2013, which is an okay movie. So I want I picked these particular movies because they they sort of 
uh, lean more towards the science fact versus the science fiction. Um, you know, I can't hold uh, Star Wars accountable for being, you know, science fantasy. I, I can't hold, uh, you know, s- Firefly accountable for being science fantasy or space fantasy uh, or space opera, even in some cases. I, I, Star, Star Wars would be space opera. Precisely. Yeah. So I, I, I'm i trying to not look at science fiction or space fiction movies, more the ones that are, are presenting themselves as being applicable possibilities you know yeah gravity was a good example of that where right. you know it was kind of you, this is this is more science fact than fiction or at least it was kind right. of built that way but you know you want any anyone who watches this show would go okay you wait you went hey, hold, hold up hold up you went from hubble to station to uh where did they go then mir i think was still floating Something around those lines, uh yeah. to tiangong one yeah uh, like all at once, and by the way, a satellite in geostationary orbit, I think it was, mm-hmm. crashed into something else, and suddenly, somehow, magically, that debris field made it down to low Earth orbit. Right. I, I don't the, know. The unfortunate thing, and it went the wrong way. Right, precisely. <laughs> so it's, we're like, it's mm. frustrating for anyone who knows anything about any topic. You know, knows enough about a topic essentially to be dangerous, right? Sure. To go into a movie based on that topic and say, no, no, no. No, 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 no. It rips you right out of the interesting parts. It rips you right out of the storyline. It rips you right out of what you're watching and why you're there, mm-hmm. right? I mean, because I think a lot of people could go to the movie, say, Avatar, for instance, sure. and not really freak out about whether or not gravity's real or not real or unobtainium is real or not real. You know, we're not going to the core saying... <laughs> I mean, you are because... The core is an amazing movie that you need to it's watch an amazing because it's so should. bad, it's hilarious. But but I guess but that's my point, right? There are certain movies, there's a particular genre of movie like 2001, like Moon, like Gravity, and like Interstellar that are purportedly very big on, oh, but we have real science, and this is these are things. We, we actually looked into these things. Well, great. It's like you looked into half of it, but you didn't look into the other half of it. It's it's so frustrating. Does that make sense? Yeah, it and, does. And it's unfortunate that uh, for whatever reason, Hollywood or movie makers for just don't decide to stick with all of the science. Does that make sense? Yes, but speaking on the flip side of that, it is Hollywood, and they do have to tell a story, and if the science doesn't tell a good story, they may have to tweak the science ever so slightly in order to tell the story, because at the end of the day, their business is to entertain you, not to educate you. Sure, but there's plenty of fringe science that is still very interesting. You know, Fringe, the TV show even, was quite interesting, but there was a decent amount of science in it enough where you kind of go all right you you got my foot in the door you got my interest there and then okay for some reason they exploded i don't understand well isn't that couldn't you say the same thing for some of these movies where they have enough science to get the foot in the door but then they just go over here i don't know it it doesn't feel like they go over here it feels like they go one one step in the wrong direction does that yes i guess i'm not understanding how uh 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 fringe fringe right yeah uh, who went crazy, like anti-science, like just, just, they just went nuts. Uh, I, how that's any different than uh, Interstellar, who went anti-science nuts too, right? I mean, right. they feel like they're the same to me. I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, we haven't seen Interstellar, so we can't say that specifically. That's cor- well, I'm basing that on comments from people that I trust. Uh, and actually, Ghost, actually, this is an interesting, you know, th- this is an interesting point. Yes. I, I guess what we're getting at is, why do these movies feel that they have to stretch the science? Mm-hmm. And what if Mythbusters made a movie? Sure. That would actually be kind of fun. Yeah, It absolutely. doesn't have to be even their television show. I mean, what what if it were just a, an actual entertaining movie, but based on for real Z science? So that brings us to the point of there's actually an organization called scienceandentertainmentexchange.org. Oh, I didn't see that in the show notes, or I would have grabbed a screenshot. That's totally fine. Where they're sort of overlying... Uh, uh, cheer is it's a difference between science fiction and science in fiction okay and so they've set up an entire organization totally available to hollywood at any given point in time not just space science but all different kinds of sciences the science of serial killers or the ocean science and all different kinds of different sciences uh, and they've helped a lot of not just movies but tv shows even things like big bang theory to make sure that the things that are being said are correct or at least correct enough to sort of pass actually big bang theory is a really good example that's 
um, outside of some of the characters, is actually a halfway decent show that mm-hmm. has good science in it. Mm-hmm. They don't they don't really do this. No. They, they... And they don't need to, and it's still entertaining, and it's still interesting. It doesn't have to grab everyone. It just has to grab, you know, enough people. And, and from all reports, it's doing quite well for it. The flip side of this, though, is that people are willing to go and see these movies and be entertained by this mm-hmm. and not understand the science. Is that really Hollywood's fault, or is that our fault as an education system for not having people be educated enough to go, what the, what are you talking about, right? Yeah. Because our core community, the community of tomorrow, will probably walk into some of these movies and go, unobtainium, James Cameron, really? But, right, I mean, come on. I don't know, that almost felt like a softball. It was sort of like, look, I'm calling it unobtainium, so you don't even have to think about it anymore. (laughs) I'm not even going to try. It's unobtainium. We're going to drill to the center of the earth. I mean... (laughs) We walk into these movies and we just right. we hang our head going, what, 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 what? Uh, why don't more people do that? Right. And, and, and if more people did do that, maybe we could get better science in these movies. Because good science doesn't have to be boring. No, it, precisely. In fact, good science, like, there is... A, Filet is is good, exciting science. Precisely. All right. I mean, it's it was a nail biter, and and the whole thing was it was dramatic and fun, and it was humanity at its best. Right. 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 And 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 why can't we have that? That's entertaining. Precisely. Precisely. But I so there's that part. But then, but in order to have that, you have to have more educated people. So maybe it's not Hollywood's fault. Maybe right. it's our fault for not having. Enough people understand right. even the fundamental basics. Mm. Interesting. Actually, weren't we just watching uh, Late Night with Jimmy Fallon? Uh, we always watch a Late Night with Jimmy no, Fallon. No, but he had a yeah. he had a particular segment on where he had a scientist on. That was awesome, and that was fun, and that was, and a that lot was fun. Of fun. Uh, if you haven't seen it, please. He was playing with liquid o- hydrogen. Yeah, please go look it up. It, it was a, He created Oxygen. an entire cloud. Uh, he put some dry ice on top of a, a heavier gas, and so it, which in a clear glass uh, container, so it looked like it was empty, but then he put the dry ice on it, and you could see. Very, yeah, it, interesting and educational and fun. There you go. I need more of that. So, what, how about you guys? What do you guys think? Uh, A, is it our fault for not educating people enough that we have these movies with bad science in it? Is it Hollywood's fault for having bad science in it? And what are the solutions here? Uh, or is it not a problem at all, right? I mean, maybe it's just entertainment, right? Maybe it doesn't have to have good science in it. Maybe it can just be entertaining and be what it is, and that's okay. Or maybe that's not okay and something else should change. What do you guys think? The community of tomorrow, leave us your comments. I'm trying something new this week. Uh-oh. I know, right? So... What I'd like you to do is the primary way I'd like for you to comment, if you don't mind, uh, the first way is using the hashtag on Twitter, hashtag TMRO. Mm. Now, you don't have to use Twitter if you don't want to. We've got a Reddit uh, community. Mm -hmm. Feel free to Reddit slash R slash TMRO. Um, feel free to comment on YouTube, but if you don't mind, anywhere you comment, add that hashtag TMRO. And I'd really like to try Twitter this week because we we don't really focus on Twitter, and I want I would like to experiment and see how that goes. And I would like to know what you think about that as well, uh, so I can kind of gather some of that data and figure out what actually works the best for interacting with you, the community of tomorrow. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And speaking of comments, we're going to talk about comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. One, zero, lift off. The fleet of space shuttles were doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. Uh, Before we get started with um, comments from our last show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode work. These are the Patreon Plus subscribers. They've contributed at least $3 to this specific episode. So thank you to all of our Patreon Plus subscribers. Uh, in addition to getting their name in the show and a couple of other things, they will also get early access to After Dark as soon as it's available. So anyone who's at Patreon Plus or above will get access to that After Dark episode right away. But oh, there's more. We also have our Patreon subscribers. For as little as $1, you get your name in the show. So you help crowdfund the show and you get your name back on the show. And I wanted to welcome... Uh, say, uh, wait, yep, that one? Joaquin Matthias. There you go. Welcome, welcome to, uh, uh... 
the, the community of tomorrow <laughs> and thank you for sponsoring this show. My brain just emptied. Uh, so you can get more information at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O and anyone who fast forwards through that because I know some of you guys do will now have no idea why I'm laughing at myself. <laughs> so it's okay. It was, um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> With no seriously, you're thank now you a Hagenbotham. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> seriously, thank you everyone for contributing. Uh, Community funded show. It helps a lot. All right. Um, <laughs> let's get started with comments before I. For sure. Did you want to say this name nope, or should I? No, nope, you do it. All you at this point. Awesome. Uh, Mossad from Patreon says, "Does the space industry have more men than women?" Probably, but it would be nice to know the statistics. We do encourage, or how do we encourage more women to be interested in space exploration? It would be great to hear from a woman's perspective. It would be great if Carrie Ann interviews some of the women in the space industry as part of the show. I, I don't disagree. And uh, to answer your question, it is predominantly male. Um, I don't know why, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know why. The female engineers that I know are remarkably good at what they do. And mm-hmm. there's, um, I would... I'm not, they're just really good. So mm-hmm. I don't think gender should have anything to do with it. Mm-hmm. So there's this huge, it's huge. It's what we, I would guess 90, 10, 90, 10, 90, sure. 90% male, 10% take. female, something like that. Yeah, it's probably um, closer to 85, I think. Somewhere in there. So at least in, in my, in my perception mm-hmm. and uh, I don't disagree. I think having more women in space would be great or, sure. or in science or in any, any, any part of that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. STEM for sure. So, yeah, sure. Absolutely. All right. Next up from Reddit. Uh, yeah, Mahala says, uh, at the thirty three thirty three mark, saying, fictitious things over and over again harms the space industry. And yet, we keep using large vehicle terms like spaceship, cargo freighter, to describe capsules, pods, and crafts like Dragon, Orion, Cygnus, Progress, ATV, HTV. And they're a lot less like a ship and more like a thingy dingy or a boat. Yeah, actually, that was something that I had never really thought of before. We do refer to them as spaceships. Right. And they're really more like space capsules. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't even call them a boat. Like maybe space rowboat. <laughs> well, they're small. Sad they're pants. tiny. They now, are. There was actually really interesting comments and conversation that happened kind of back and forth on this mm-hmm. uh, in regards to this exact comment in that, you know, back in the Christopher Columbus days, those ships that they were huge back in that day, right. they're just a minuscule part of a carrier at right. this point, right? So it's all perspective on size. Mm-hmm. You know, a Dragon spacecraft is the largest space capsule we have. Mm-hmm. Or uh, Orion. I, I don't know which. W- whatever. Th- th- those, those capsules that like that are the largest human-rated crafts that we can send into space. Right. So um, calling them spaceships maybe isn't wrong. I mean, just because they're small, right. they're still large for space. But I, but I think spacecraft, though, is still relatively accurate. Yeah. I'm not against spacecraft. I think, we use, I think yes. we traditionally use the word spacecraft, though, don't we, as opposed well, to spaceship? We do, but hmm. there have been times when, particularly you and I, have said spaceship. Uh, it sounds more impressive. It sounds more exciting. It it conjure up, conjures up the idea of, of Star Trek. Uh, you know, all of those sorts of things. And so I, I think it's a very fine line between what it probably should be categorized as versus the uh, the hype behind, you know, the the marketing thereof. Does that make sense? Right. Oh. Yeah. So, yes. Yes, but no, but yes. Yes, but no, but yes. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a good way. All right, next up from YouTube. Uh, TNM001 from YouTube says, I have to agree with Mars One here. They have been to the Mars Society Convention 2014, and all they did was talk about how this show, how this show could be like the oh i see how their show could be more like the football world series and thus gain enough money to do all of what they promise fact is nothing is in place yet no hardware no real plan all answers to their questions are vague and i can give them exactly like they did only basic knowledge of space necessary yeah so the basic concept being that they um a team NM001, easy for me to say. Exactly. Basically agrees with me on Mars One saying, yeah, they have, there's, they, they've they been at all of these conferences and all of these things, right. and they haven't really given a viable plan. And that, right. that remains my, my main gripe with Mars One, is they really haven't. So then in the show, people said, hey, you guys should bring someone on, like Lars or whomever, from Mars One. Mm-hmm. And so I did. I got in contact. I hit the little web form, and I got in contact. And I was like, hey, you know, 
I would really like to bring someone on and talk about this stuff. And they gave me basically a form letter back of like, we're really popular and we can't do something for everyone. So here's our FAQ. I'm like, I know your FAQ, your FAQ. Right. Frequently asked questions. Uh, I, this is why I have, this is why I want to bring you on the show. Cause I look at this and I go, what? No. So just out of curiosity on their frequently asked questions page, do they address any of these issues? Well, they try to. Because it seems to me that poorly. they are frequently asked questions and maybe they should give an answer there too. No, they need to give better answers. Okay, but you, you want to see what <laughs> yes, I'm yes. Okay. So uh I'm now so I, I I kind of took it as far as I had contacts for, so now I'm throwing this out to the community of tomorrow. I would like to bring someone on the show and I'd like to talk about these things. This isn't a I'm not looking to burn them at the stake or say, what What are you doing? I, we really have serious doubts and questions about the program. I just like to ask them and answer some of these questions right. and see what they have to say and maybe convince me and others. Maybe not. I don't know. I will absolutely keep an open mind. But Community of Tomorrow, if you have contact information for someone over there who can actually get things done, please send it my way. Uh, Benjamin at TMRO.TV is my email address. Otherwise, uh, just... Tweet me, just hashtag TMRO or at Ben Credible, whatever, however you want to get a hold of me, leave it in comments, whatever you've got. Um, I think it would be very valuable to bring them on a space show, and I think it's a little bit weird that a uh, community trying to go to space is avoiding the space community and avoiding getting on a show. It just it adds to my level of like, yeah, they don't want to go on a show that knows what they're talking about. So maybe, I don't know. Or, or maybe they really are busy and they're just like, mm, you're too small and we don't care. What I don't know. I don't know. So anyhow. Um, all right. Uh, next up. Uh, next up is... Ah. Yes. This person from YouTube. <laughs> Siderite? I don't know. Zach Widex? I'm not making it up. I, you know, I'm... I, I asked Ben specifically if he had chose all of these particular... Uh, maybe. Comments because... Which is funny because you're the one who's supposed to be pronouncing them. Anyway... Sidright says, I don't think we really necessarily make the, the butt of the joke. We're because, talking about Mars One at this point. Yep, because they are not funny. But dum dum On the devil's advocate side, I think Mars One is a marketing tool, but one that can actually further the visibility and maybe even the funding for actual technical solutions for going to Mars. Even arguments like these between people that are discussing both sides of Mars One are actually helping. I don't know if it is. Uh, there is, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's the common phrase, you know, there's no such thing as bad press. Right. And that's wrong. There absolutely is a, a thing as bad press. Right. And you can create this perception in the mind of humans uh, that this thing is stupid or not worth doing. Right. Um, or it's a gimmick or it's all snake oil or something like that. And we need to avoid that perception. Yes. I think that's important because otherwise, in order to actually get humans on Mars, you're going to have to not only figure out the technological hurdles and the monetary hurdles mm -hmm. to doing this, but now you got to figure out the political and willpower hurdles on top of all of that mm -hmm. because someone decided that they wanted to screw the whole thing up. Right. So... Yeah, I think it can be bad. I absolutely think it can be bad. And and I'm not pointing at some, them saying this is this is what's going to do it. If they're capable of making this happen, then very different story. Mm -hmm. But if they're if they're not, uh, this this could be bad for the industry, I think. It could be. So, all right, moving on. Uh, Sigrun from YouTube says, I missed your co-host. Thank you. Anyway, I have a question. <laughs> Could you find out if the feather unlocking mechanism requires a single motion by the operator, or does it have some kind of interlock button of some kind? I'm asking because I wonder if the unlock mechanism could be activated inadvertently by a moment of the operator without the operator intending to unlock it. A good design would have some kind of interlock button or switch requiring two or more motions to activate a critical control. I'm sure someone would know the answer to this. I just don't know who to ask. So I don't know. Uh, there are two parts to the feathering system yeah. to kind of answer your question in a different way. Uh, so simply unlocking the feather system should not have engaged the feather system. Right. That's part one. Now you're asking, okay, well, maybe they didn't mean to unlock it. My understanding, having not seen the footage, but they made, the NTSB made it sound like, and I'm making some assumptions here, made it sound like uh, the co-pilot did, in fact, purposely unlock the feather. We do not know why. So it could be instrumentation. It could have just been a mistake. It could have been training. It could have been any number of things. We don't know why he unlocked it, but he did. So even if it was a two-mechanism system, like a push and uh, execute, it likely still would have been unlocked. 
So there's that. But even with that, even with that happening, even with you unlocking the feathering system, it still should not have engaged. Yeah. You have to actually engage the feathering system, I believe, on the other side of the craft from I the pilot. So, so um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but as I understand it, that's how that actually works. All right. Moving on to, uh, ooh, hey, our last comment for this show. Did you want to say who it was? No, no, it's all you. Oh, because I figured you could pronounce this one. <laughs> I can. Chris from YouTube says, Would NASA allow a launch of Cygnus on the Liberty rocket? I would expect them to require an unfunded demo launch with that combination as the rocket hasn't been proven yet. Yeah, so this goes back to me speculating, pure speculation, that, hey, maybe by having Antares uh, have a rapid unscheduled disassembly on the launch pad, right. this re-enables the life of Liberty. Now, a lot of you had very valid points saying that's crazy talk, which it is. It is totally crazy talk. Um, but I would, if I were them, I would at least kind of look at it and say, is this something we can do? There are valid issues that were brought up, like the Liberty rocket, the solid motor on the Liberty rocket is way more powerful than Antares. So you'd have to, like, pad 0A is not taking that. And pad 39A and B are kind of already taken, although you don't need quite something of that size for a single uh, solid motor. But, you know, you don't have a pad to launch it from, A. Uh, B, which this brings up a valid point, it is a new rocket, so you'd have to recertify the whole thing. Although, a lot of it is already pre-certified. Mm -hmm. So, there's that, but you probably would have to fly it for free at least once to make sure that the whole thing works. The third problem is that you actually, the whole upper stage is actually taken from uh, Arion Space, if I remember right. I don't right. remember who the upper stage was, but I think it was in, uh, like, a Vulcan. I don't remember who. I. So... Uh, but the upper stage is not ATK based, so you got to figure out that side of it. Uh, and then you got the pricing problems with it, and can you spin up the program? I mean, there's so many hurdles right. to making this a viable program. I understand it's extremely unlikely, and no one has said boo about this, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't like I'm hearing, hearing murmurings in the industry. I'm the only one who has said this, but I kind of looked at that and said, well, you know, if I'm orbital ATK and I'm doing supply missions to station, wouldn't I try to use a solid fuel based rocket to get there? So yeah, uh, I think uh, with all the things that I just mentioned, it is very unlikely that Liberty will be a stopgap from here to there over the next year or two before Antares is fixed. Now, um, then I wonder if they actually will just drop a, a, a new Russian engine on the bottom of Antares mm. or if they'll move to something else. They'll probably just do a new Russian engine because they already know those parts, but you know, there's never a chance. Like basically what I'm getting at is maybe Liberty's not dead. Maybe it's not going to happen for this two-year thing. Maybe it's not even going to happen for from now through Antares 2. But, you know, I'm kind of looking at this going, this gives them a reason and excuse to kind of dust off those plans and go, maybe this will work. So, all right. Uh, yeah. That's our... That's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Uh, again, Twitter, hashtag TMRO for all of your comments, questions, anything that you've got. Keep, keep them, and the best part about using Twitter is it keeps your comments shorter so we don't have like these pages and pages of things that end up on us. Uh, we still some, like those, we, we Once in a while, they're them. okay, but we see them and we're like, okay, we need to edit this down because this is insane. 140 characters, so hashtag TMRO. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, stay tuned. After Dark is up next. If you're a Patreon Plus subscriber, you're going to get that for free as soon as it's available. Everyone else, that should will be available in approximately four weeks. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.